Where we're going to start tonight, you guys, if you open your book to the math appendix, which starts on page 174. That what we're going to go over tonight is on page 177 and 178. How many, how many of you guys have ever worked out or calculated math problems using a T formula like you see in your book there on, the, on page 178? Just a few? OK. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you guys a quick video on some basics of a T formula. And then we're going to work those four problems on page 178. Okay. Now, not all the math problems in the book will I use a T formula, but a large number of them I will. And I think once you just understand the basics of how to use a T formula and the fact that you're always going to have two variables and you're solving for the unknown and there's the three formulas that come out of that T, you're always going to choose one of them to find the unknown variable. So I think once you guys get accustomed to using it, you'll feel pretty comfortable with it. Now, the one thing that you might notice, you guys, that in, the, in that video right there, you notice that the rate and the total are flip-flopped as far as where they're at on the bottom of the T. It doesn't matter if the rate was on the left side or the right side. It doesn't matter, OK? You're going to get the same answer regardless. I've just have always put the rate on the left and then the total on the right, OK? So that doesn't matter at all. Now, the next video I'm going to show you goes over more real estate specific math problems. And I know the guy's voice makes you want to stab yourself in the eye, and I'm sorry about that. But it's a really good video, I, I think, to go over and show you the basic elements and then how to use a, a T formula. OK, so from those videos, you guys, you kind of get a basic understanding of this T formula right here. OK? And you could see in your book on page 178 that when I have that T formula drawn out, the variables that you're going to put into that T up on the top, you're going to put either the part of the total, the smaller of the two numbers, the total commission, or the net proceeds. Those are the variables that are going to go on the top of the T. And then down on the left side, and again, it doesn't matter if the bottom sides are, are reversed. Okay, So you're, the rate's going to equal the commission rate or the net percentage. And then over here, the total will be the larger number or the sale price. Now, any time that you have a variable on the top of the T and one on the bottom, whether it's on the left or the right, you're always going to divide those to get the unknown. And then if you have both variables on the bottom, then you're going to multiply those to get the top variable, which is going to be the unknown. And that's what these formulas are. And these are in your book. So I just abbreviate these is if we had a variable on the top, which would be the total commission, and we had a variable down on the bottom left, which would be your commission rate, the total commission divided by the commission rate would equal the sale price. So top divided by left will equal the right. And then total commission divided by the sale price would equal the commission rate. And then if we have two variables on the bottom, the total commission, or excuse me, the sale price times the commission rate would give us the total commission. Okay, So those are the three formulas that you get out of that T. And you're always going to be able to solve for the unknown variable by using one of those three formulas right there. Okay, It's always going to be the case when you use the T. You have two variables, and you're solving for the unknown using one of these three formulas. And again, if you have one variable on the top and one on the bottom, you divide. And if you have two variables on the bottom, you're going to multiply those to get the unknown. OK? So let's look at, let's look at uh, practice problem number one on page 178. It says, Broker, da Broker Dave receives $4,900 in commission. His listing stated that he was to receive a 7% commission. What was the sale price of the property? So based on those two variables, do we have our components for our T? 
Yes, what two variables do we know in this problem right here? We know the total commission and we know the commission rate. So where would the total commission go on the T? The top or the bottom? It's going to go on the top. That's right. So we have $4,900. And then we have the commission rate of 7%. And again, since we have one variable on the top and one on the bottom, are we going to multiply or divide those? We're going to divide those. That's right. So 4900 divided by 7% would give you a sale price of 70000 Number two, what would be the gross or total commission if a $65,000 home was sold and the seller paid the broker a 6% commission? So in problem number two, do we have our components for our T? Yeah, what do we know in this problem here? No, are you sure? In number two, we know what? We know the sale price and we know the commission rate, okay? So we'd have the sale price. Where's the sale price going to go? On the bottom, I, well, I use the bottom right, so 65000 And then where would our commission rate go? Our commission rate would go over on the other side at 6%. And again, since we have two variables on the bottom, are we going to multiply those or divide them? We're going to multiply those. So 65,000 times 6% would give you a total commission of 3,900. Three, what is the broker's commission rate if he receives a total commission of $3,450 on a $57,000 sale. So in problem number three, do we have our components for our T? Yeah, what do we know here? We know the total commission, and we know what else? The sale price. So again, where does the total commission go? That goes up on top. So our total commission is $3,450. And what else do we know? We know the sale price of? 57,000. And again, since you have one variable on the top and one on the bottom, are you going to multiply those or divide? You're going to divide those. Okay. So 3450 divided by 57,000 would give you a commission rate of 6%. Number four, the owner lists a property with a broker at a price that will net the seller. 56000 after paying the broker a 7% commission, what is the list price? So do we have our, our components for our T here? Yeah, what do we know in this problem? And what else? Right, we know the seller net. Now, is that seller net, is that the sale price? No, and we always figure the commission on the sale price not what the seller is netting. That's why we have to invert the commission on this problem right here, because this is one of those seller net problems. OK? So remember, where would, the, where would the seller net go in the T? That goes up on top, because that's going to be the smaller of the two numbers. So 56,000 is their net. And remember, what is that extra step? How do we invert the commission based on the video? You just take you just take a hundred percent minus seven percent. So a hundred minus seven percent will equal 0.93 or ninety-three percent. And the reason we do that is because we always figure the commission on the list or the sale price, not the list price or what the seller netted. So again, since we have one variable on the top and one on the bottom, do we multiply those or divide? Divide. So 56,000 divided by 93% would give you a list price of 60,125. Okay. So those are some those are some good practice problems, you guys, to use with our T. Now, next Tuesday, what we'll do is we'll go over the practice problems on page 183. So if you look on page 183. You'll see the 10 practice problems. So between now and next week, 
Work on those 10 practice problems on page 183 because we'll work those the first part of class next Tuesday, okay? And then the week after that, we'll do the practice problems on page 184 and 185. And you'll notice that they get progressively a little bit tougher, okay? Now, remember earlier I said that the math, you guys, that's the least of your worries on the state exam because on each section, both the national and state specific, <laughs> you're probably only going to get anywhere between three and six math problems. And remember, what score do you need to pass? 75%. So if you only get three to five math problems, could you miss every math problem and still get 75%? Yeah. Now, I hope your standards are a little bit higher than that. But even if they're not, you could still miss every, practice or every math problem and still pass very easily. Okay. But if you feel pretty comfortable with the math problems that we do in here, Trust me, you will have no problem with the math on the state exam, okay? Now, one of the other things that I want to go over in the math appendix is on page 179 and 180. And remember from the video, it talked about how do we determine the area for a square for a square or a rectangle, OK? So how do we determine the area for either a square or a rectangle? Well, in your book on page 179, you always take the width times the length will equal the, and we're assuming that, the, that these lots are going to be measured in feet and not miles or meters, OK? So let's say that the area of this lot is 50 feet by 50 feet by 50 feet by 50 feet, OK? So to determine the area, what would we do? 50 width times length, 50 times 50 would be 2,500 square feet, OK? And then for the rectangle, if this was 100 by 75, OK, how would we determine the area? Width times length. Now, width is always the first number that's given, you guys. And the width is always equal to what we call the front footage of that lot, OK? So when you look at this, it's ne the, 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 the numbers are, ne are, are never going to be length times width. It's always width times length will equal your square footage. And remember, the width, which is the first number that's given, that's always equal to the what we call the front footage of that lot. So how would we determine the area? 100 times 75 would be 7,500 square feet. Okay. So if we had another lot that was, again, a rectangle, and it was 100 by 25, then how would we determine that area? 100 times 25 would be 2,500 square feet. OK, does that make, does that seem pretty easy? OK, what if we had a room? What if we had two rooms? Let's say that we had a living room. And let's say that living room was 15 by 20. And the family room, and the family room was 25 by 30. OK? So if we were going to, say, replace the carpet in the living room and the family room, OK, and we needed to determine and get a measurement and to get the square footage of those rooms, how would we do that? So you'd multiply those. So 15 by 20. 15 by 20 would be 300 square feet. And 25 times 30 would be 750 square feet. So we'd, then we'd just add those up. So that'd be 1,050 square feet. OK? Now, what if that floor covering was sold by the, say if you were buying carpet, and a lot of times carpet is sold by the square yard, OK? So how would you convert those? If, 
If you look over on page 180, where you see the surface area conversions, to convert square yards to square feet, you multiply the square yards by 9. And 9 is used because there are 9 square feet in one square yard. So if the dimensions of these rooms were given in square feet, and we were buying carpet that was sold by the square yard, how would we determine how many square yards of carpet to, that we need? We'd have to divide that by 9 because there's 9 square feet in one square yard. So 1,050 divided by 9 would give us, or 1,050 divided by 9 would give us 116.6 square yards. Now, what if the areas that we were measuring were in square yards, how would we convert it to square feet? Then you'd have to multiply it times 9, because again, there's 9 square feet in one square yard. Okay, Does that make sense for determining the area for either a square or a rectangle? We're not going to get into a triangle tonight. We'll get into that in another lesson. So again, for next week, you guys, Try to work the practice problems on page 183, and we'll go over those the first part of class. And then in two weeks, we'll go over the practice problems on page 184 and 185. And then two, one of the other weird things that you'll see me doing is throughout the lesson, I'll hold up a piece of paper like this. Okay, And the reason that I'm going to do that is because I'm going to try to break down the videos by the Roman numerals in the lessons. And the only way, well, not the only way, but the an easy way to do that is every time I finish one of the Roman numerals and I'm going to start on another one, I'll just hold one of these up. So then when I'm going through and editing the video, I'll know exactly where I need to put a break so that you guys, so I could, so I could try to make the videos based on the outline in the book. So like tonight, we have one, two, three, we have three Roman numeral, well, four with the practice problem. So after each Roman numeral, I'll hold up a piece of paper so I'll know that's where the break is going to be. So then when you guys are looking at the, at the videos, when I have it is Roman numeral one, two, and three, you'll know that Roman numeral one will just be the, the, lex the lecture portion from Roman numeral one in your book. And then Roman numeral two and three, et cetera, depending on how many Roman numerals that we have in that or in that particular lesson. So is that going to be easier for you guys when you're going through the videos to do it uh, based on the outlines? I think that's going to be a little bit easier because then you'll know exactly what areas, like if you said, well, hey, I wanted to go over uh, letter B in Roman numeral one, you'll know exactly where you need to go. Okay, so you don't have to watch the entire video. You'll know what, what, what section that you'd need to go to. And we, are, we already downloaded and edited the, the video for last week's lecture. So I, I'll have that up in YouTube tomorrow. And what I'll do is I'll send an email out through Canvas, and I'll send you the YouTube link that you guys could use for the video. So then if you want to go back and you want to review it, you can do that. So in here, when I, if I, do, when I record the video on Tuesday night, I'm probably not going to have it downloaded, compressed, and edited probably until Friday or, or the following Monday, okay? Because it takes time to do it. It takes about four and a half to five hours to download that video and compress it, and then we have to go through and edit it. So it takes a little while to go through that process. So probably like Friday or Monday is when I'll have the lecture up for that particular week. So any questions on anything before we get started with lesson two? No? Okay. So the first part gets into what is real property? So real property is going to consist of land, plus the tenements, improvements, appurtenances. It transfers with a deed. And the grantor is the one giving up ownership, and the grantee is the one receiving ownership. So let's go through those. So real property equals land. 
So if you have just a vacant parcel, that would be land. And would that vacant parcel be considered real property? Yeah, because it's land. So what else would you would be included as part of that real property besides the land? Well, all the tenements, improvements, and appurtenances. Now, tenements, you guys, tenements and improvements are basically, they're kind of the same thing, except a tenement is a man-made improvement versus a natural improvement. Now, I don't know many people, and even on the state exam, you might need to know just the, the definitions or the terms for each one of those, but normally you don't see people referring to improvements as tenements, whether they're man-made or not. They just refer to them as just improvements, okay? So what do you think are, is an example of an improvement that you could put on that land, whether it's man-made or natural? A pool. So if you put a pool on that land, that would be an improvement. What else? A house. That would be an improvement, okay? What else? Okay, if you put a fire pit back there, okay? How about if you put a fence that went around your property? Would that be an improvement? Yeah, those are all going to be improvements, whether they're man-made improvements or natural improvements. Now, what do you think might be an example of a natural improvement on your land? What? Maybe if it was a tree that was not planted by a human. What else? A what? Yeah, what if you had a, a pond on there that was a natural pond or a stream that went through your property or a lake that was on your property that was not man-made? That would be an example of a, of a natural improvement. So land is, or real property is going to consist of land plus any improvements, whether they're man-made improvements or natural improvements. And then also appurtenances. And that, that term appurtenant, you guys, that means it's attached to the land, okay? And when I say it's attached to the land, that means if this property is ever sold or conveyed to somebody else, that appurtenance is going to remain on the, with the land. So what would be considered a, um, an appurtenance? Some, maybe uh, an easement would be, could be a pertinent, a right of way could be, is a pertinent in a lot of cases, CC and R's are a pertinent. Now, an easement, you guys, and we'll talk a little bit about easements tonight. We'll talk more about them next week. But easement is just the right to use the land of another. You don't own the land. You just have the right to use it. So let's say, for example, that let's say there was a, let's say there was a 10-foot utility easement that went across the back of that property right there, OK? If that easement was a, a pertinent easement, then that means that it's attached to the land. So if this, if this person sold that property, would the new buyer have to keep that easement that goes across the back of the property? Yes, because it's attached to the land. That's what a pertinent means, attached to the land. Maybe depends on when it depends when that easement was created, as to whether or not you're gonna if it was after the fact. Like if it was after you bought your property and SRP needed access, they might compensate you. They might compensate you for that. Then when you sell, it goes with the property. It would go with the prop. If it was a pertinent, yes. And there's different types of easements, whether they're a pertinent or what we call a gross easement. We'll talk about those in another lesson, but. We're going to assume that this is an appurtenant easement, and if it is, it's going to remain with the land. Same thing with a right-of-way, which is very similar to an easement. It gives you the right to use a strip of land. You don't own it. You just have the right to use it, okay? CC and R's. How many of you guys live in an area where it's governed by a homeowner's association? Okay, probably a lot of us. So you have CC and R's, and those stand for, and we'll talk about these a little bit more at the end of the chapter. Condi uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. And basically, what are those CC&Rs? 
some might think that th some might think that they're BS. Okay, how many of you guys aren't in favor of things like this? You're okay. Why why do we have them then if people think they're BS? That's right to protect the value of your home. I don't think HOAs and CCNRs are a bad thing. I think some of the people that are on some HOA boards are the ones that give HOAs a bad name. Because HOAs and CCNRs, I think, were created for a good purpose, and that's to preserve your property values. Because how many of you guys want your neighbor painting their house 12 different colors and parking three cars on their front lawn? How many of you guys want that? OK. And, that, and probably because you don't have any restrictions in your neighborhood. Now, you might have CCNRs that were created by the city. And if they're created by the city, it's the city's responsibility to, to enforce those. And they might not enforce them. So you could live in an area where they have CCNRs, but there's no HOA that's going to enforce those. So whoever created those would be the one that is responsible to, um, to enforce those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Same with my old neighborhood. My old neighborhood, we had one color scheme, and that was it. You had one color scheme for the, the body. The trim was one specific color, and that was it. Now, I kind of like that. But over time, as properties started to evolve, buyers wanted something different. So in order to keep pace with what was going on in the marketplace, eventually we said, you know what? We need to start adopting more colors. And we started to adopt the colors that were part of the master plan community. because. Our little subdivision was part of a master plan community. So not only did we have CCNRs for our little subdivision, but there was also CCNRs for the master plan community. And we had to stay within the color schemes of the master plan community as well. So we went from one color scheme to same thing, Tony, like, or Stephen, like six or seven different color schemes that we had to choose from, which then people were like, hey, this is great. I don't have to choose just the one color scheme. I have like six or seven different choices now. And then you started driving around the neighborhood, and you noticed that people were starting to change those. And that was something that, that buyers were like, because they liked properties that had some updated colors instead of the old schemes from the early to mid-90s. Now, real property, you guys, the document that transfers ownership of real property is called a deed. Okay, and there's two parties to a deed. You have the grantor and the grantee. Okay, the, if it ends in OR, that's the one that's giving up ownership, and if it ends in EE, that's the one receiving ownership. So, who do you think the grantor is? The seller or the buyer? That's the seller, that's the one who's giving up ownership. And then the buyer is the grantee. They're the one that's receiving ownership. Okay. So when we talk about what is real property, real property is going to consist of land, any improvements that are on that land, such as a house, a pool, a fire pit, a fence, a detached garage, a built-in barbecue. Okay. That is going to be that is going to be real property. And when you sell that real property, the D or the document that could, that you're going to that's going to be used to convey ownership is going to be known as a deed. And a grantor is the seller; that's the one that's giving up ownership. And the grantee would be the buyer; that's the one that's receiving ownership. Now, one of the other things that you want to remember about real property is it's permanently attached. So, if you had a a built-in barbecue, would that be real property? Yeah, but what about if you had a, a barbecue that was on wheels that you could move around? No, that would be personal property because one of the distinguishing features of real property is that it is permanently attached. Not that you can't remove it at some point. You certainly can do that. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
but real property is permanently attached and it's intended to stay attached unless it is removed. So we said real property consists of land, so land is going gonna, is gonna to consist of what we call the surface, the subsurface, and the air rights. So land will be your surface rights, your subsurface rights, and your air rights. Okay. Now these are also a pertinent. So they will they are attached to the land and they will convey with the land unless they are sold or leased separately. So if you own a piece of land, could you sell your air rights to somebody? Or could you lease your air rights to somebody? Sure. Could you sell or lease your subsurface rights to somebody? Sure. Could you sell or lease your surface rights to somebody? Sure, you could do that. So if, the, if, if John Doe here owned this property, and John Doe decided to sell his air rights, and he sold those to somebody in 2010, if John Doe wanted to sell the property in 2016, when the buyer took ownership, would the buyer get the air rights? No, why? Because they were sold previously in 2010. So when you buy a piece of real property, you're going to get the land plus all the improvements and appurtenances. You're also going to get the surface, the subsurface, and the air rights, unless those are sold or leased separately. Now, if they're sold or leased separately, that's something that would have to be disclosed to a buyer, or if it wasn't disclosed, it's probably going to show up when they do a, a title search. Would Stephen? Yes, exactly. And air rights really aren't a big deal out here, and they're really not that valuable here. But if you were in a place where you couldn't build this way, but you could build this way, air rights could be pretty valuable. And I read an article a couple of years ago that there's, there was a church in New York City that owned a piece of property that backed to Central Park. And they were going to build a, a church there, but there was a developer that owned a piece of land right across the street that was building these luxury high-rise condos. Now what the developer did of the high-rise condos is they bought the air rights from the church. Because if they bought the air rights, you're going to restrict them from building up. Because if the church decided that they were going to build up, they could impede the view of these luxury condos that they were selling that, and it would impede the view of Central Park. So the developer bought the air rights from the, from the church for $17 million. So that was a, uh, that's, that's a situation where air rights were extremely valuable, but here, I don't, I've never heard of a story of somebody buying air rights for a significant amount in Arizona. Maybe they have, but I've never heard of any cases here because they really are not a, a, a big issue. But air rights are just your reasonable airspace above your, above your land. Because those are part of what we call zoning restrictions. So every, every parcel of land is going to have a, is, going to be, is, is going to have a zoning classification. And there's going to be zoning restrictions in cities and counties. So you might live in a city where they say, okay, if you have a commercial property and it's zoned for commercial use, you could only have that, that building could only be 50 feet high. That's the zoning restriction. Now, if you wanted to build something higher than 50 feet, you would have to get permission in order to do that. Because you're basically applying to, um, you're you're applying to be non-conforming because you want to build something that's not conforming to current zoning. So there's a process that you have to go through to either get a variance or a change of zoning in order to get something like that approved. So again, when you buy a piece of real property, you guys, what do you get? You get the land. Okay, and what else do you get? You get the improvements that are on there, whether they're man-made or natural, okay? And again, what would be an improvement? A house, a garage, a pool, a fence, a well, 
Those are all going to be improvements. How about things like utilities? Would utilities be an improvement? Yeah. Now, you don't own the utility lines that run to your home. The utility company does. But do those utilities that run to your property, do they add value? So when you have electricity and sewer and cable and gas and all those utilities, those add value to your property. Now, do the utility companies install those with the intention of ever removing those? No, they're intended to be permanent. So those are improvements that you don't own but also add value to your property. So when you buy a piece of real property, you get the land plus all the improvements, whether they're man-made or natural, all the appurtenances, anything that's attached to the land, such as an easement, a right-of-way, CC&Rs. You're going to get the surface, the subsurface, and the air rights, as long as those are not sold or leased otherwise. Number five, hereditaments. That's an inheritable right or anything that can be inherited, whether it's real property or personal property. So if you own a piece of land, could you will that land to one of your heirs? Yeah, you could do that. You could will the land. Could you will the surface rights of your land to somebody? Could you will the subsurface or the air rights to somebody? Sure, could you will any improvements on that land to somebody? Yeah, you could. So that's what a hereditament is, you guys. It's any sort of inheritable right, whether you're willing real property or whether you're willing personal property. Number six, a reservation. Those are uses that the grantor withholds from the title being conveyed. So for example, if you had a landowner, let's say the landowner owned that property right there. And let's say we had a lake back here. And the owner decided, well, I'm going to split my parcel into two pieces, and I'm going to build my house on one parcel, and I'm going to sell the other one off. So let's say that the, you have parcel A and parcel B now. So let's say that the landowner keeps parcel A. He's going to sell off parcel B, but he wants to retain the right to use the back 20 feet of that property to get access to the lake. That's what you call a reservation. So when the, when the deed is created for parcel B, the owner would put a restriction or what we call a reservation in that deed, which gives that landowner the right and reserves the right to use that back 20 feet of that parcel. Now, would property owner A own that back 20 feet of B's land? No, they just have the right to do what? They just have the right to use it. So it's similar to an easement, okay, but it's called a reservation because this is something that is created by the deeded owner of the property when that deed is created. Because can landowners put restrictions in their deed, like something like this? Yeah. And when we were going over this, um, years ago, what I used to do is uh, students used to bring in current events before class or at the beginning of class and we'd talk about them. And those current events would be something that's related to the topic that we're covering that night. And one of the students brought in when we were talking about uh, deed restrictions, where in areas of the South, there's still a lot of old deed restrictions that landowners put on their property that showed that they couldn't sell their property to minorities. So are those legal today? Could you put a deed restriction in there that says, I am putting a restriction in, on my deed that said that you could not sell that property to a minority. No, because that would be in violation of federal fair housing laws. So no, you couldn't do that. But the whole point of the article was, why are those old illegal deed restrictions still in the public records? They should be removed. So, but could a, a landowner go in and put a restriction such as this, such as a reservation? Where they're reserving the right to use that back 20 feet of the property, they could absolutely do that. It could be. And you know what, Patrick, we'll talk about that uh, next week when we talk about easements. Because if that's the only way to get to your land, that wouldn't be a right of way. That would be an appurtenant easement because it would be by necessity if you didn't have ingress and egress. And we'll talk about that next, more next week. Okay, now personal property, 
Personal property is movable. It transfers with a bill of sale. And there's another term for personal property, you guys, that you'll see uh, what used frequently called chattel. So chattel is referring to anything that is personal property. So what would be considered personal property? Furniture, cars, jewelry, clothing, money, stocks, bonds. Those would all be considered personal property. Uh, it depends. We'll, we're gonna, we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, if it's not permanently attached to the land, then that would be personal property. Now, a fixture, well, before we get to fixtures, um, personal property, you guys, that's going to transfer what we call a bill of sale. So if you bought a lawnmower from your neighbor and your neighbor said, okay, I'll sell you the lawnmower for 50 bucks, and you gave them the 50 bucks and they gave you a bill of sale that said that they are selling you that lawnmower for $50, that's going to be your evidence of ownership right there, okay? Now, remember we said, what's that document that transfers the ownership of real property? A deed, that's right, okay? So personal property is going to transfer with a bill of sale. Um, fixtures, those are items that was, they were once tangible personal property, but they've been attached to and made part of the land or improvements. Now, a fixture, you guys, is always something that originally was personal property, but now that it's been permanently attached, it's now real property. So an example of that, if you went and bought a ceiling fan, and when you bought that ceiling fan and it's sitting in the box in the living room where you're going to install it, when it's sitting in the box in the living room, is that real property or is it personal property? It's personal property. But once you take it out of the box and put it together and attach it to the ceiling and, the ele and to the electrical wires, now it becomes what? Now it becomes real property. That projector right there, when you bought, when, if you bought a projector like that for a home theater in your house, when you bought that projector, is it real or personal property? It's personal property, but once you install it and attach it to the ceiling, or if you attached it to the wall, now it becomes real property. If you, have a mic if you bought a microwave and that microwave was in the box, is that real or personal property? personal, but once you take it out of the box and attach it underneath the cabinets, now it becomes real property. So pretty much everything in your house at one point was a, fix, is, was a fixture, well, was personal property, and then once it became attached, is now a fixture or real property. How about that TV? When TV went, well, you would think that when you buy a flat screen TV, and if that flat screen TV is sitting, uh, if it's on a stand and it's sitting on a table, would that be real or personal property? Personal. personal property. But once you take that flat screen TV and you mount it to a bracket and you mount that bracket to the wall, now it becomes what? It becomes real property. Now, well, but again, what is the intention? Are you intending for that TV to be attached or not? And we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about the legal tests of a fixture. And every time we have a new revision of our purchase contract, which we have a new one coming out in February, there's a section in our contract that shows what is a fixture. And every time we have a new revision of our contract, that box that shows what's a fixture gets bigger. Because there's always something that is in question is whether or not it's personal property or whether it's real property. And I remember when I first started selling real estate in 1992 that one of the, the items that, that was in question were water softeners. Because back then we didn't have a section in our contract that said, what is a fixture? So people thought, well, I bought a water softener, and since I bought it, it's personal property, and when I leave, I could take it with me. But what is that water softener attached to? It's attached to pipes that come out of the wall, so that would be real property. But that was always an item that was in question, and then at some point it became a fixture on our contract. So if it shows as a fixture on our contract, that's part of the real property. So if you sold your home, would that fixture have to remain? Because remember we said real property consists of land plus the what? Improvements, and would a fixture be an improvement? Yeah, absolutely it would. So that's why it's always a good idea when you take a listing to go through and 
kind of give the seller a little bit of, of an education on what is a fixture and what is personal property because honestly sometimes they don't know and they might take something that's a fixture that they think well hey that chandelier that's in the entryway that's been in our family for 40 years and I'm taking that with me I have no intentions of leaving it if they if they don't know the difference between real and personal property would that chandelier have to stay yeah it would unless they disclosed it to the buyer that it's not going to convey but unless you have this conversation with them they might not know and then the buyer moves uh, closes escrow and they move in and that chandelier is gone and guess who's probably going to be buying a new chandelier for the buyer probably the real estate agents because it's a lot easier to buy a chandelier than to get sued and have to use your errors and omissions insurance to represent yourself so that's one way to to avoid having something like that happen is just go through just talk about this with the seller and say here's what a fixture is here's what personal property is and are you intending on taking any of the fixtures in your home and if they say oh well yes that chandelier in the entryway in the ceiling fans in the bedrooms we're taking those with us and you and they have two options at that point they could either take them down before they list the property which I would always recommend and re if they're going to replace it with something then replace it with whatever the replacement is going to be and then at that point the buyer comes through and they don't see that there's a different fixture than what they're going to end up with but some sellers don't agree with that and they'll say I'll take it down later well, if that's the case, you better make sure that you disclose to the buyer in the contract that whatever fixture is, is not going, going to convey, that you disclose it to them. Because if you don't, would that have to stay with the, as part of the real property? It would. And if you don't, then chances are one of the real estate agents or both are going to be buying new fixtures for the buyer. Well, it, 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 it really doesn't matter if you put that in the listing if a fixture does and does not convey. You have to make sure that you put it in the purchase contract because what if the buyer doesn't see the listing? Or what if they don't read it? So that's not where you'd want to disclose, hey, that chandelier and the ceiling fans are not going to convey. You'd want to put it in the purchase contract that they write and they submit to the seller. Now, an agent, I, I always put fixtures that are not going to convey I put it in the listing under the section it's called realtor remarks and the buyers don't have access to that information only the agents do so if an agent is looking at the listing and they are reading through it and they see oh the chandelier and the in the ceiling fans don't convey they'd want to let the buyer know that and when they write the offer they would want to make sure that they put it in the in the offer buyer is aware that the chandelier and ceiling fans do not convey. Now, if they don't put it in there, then the seller would have to come back with a counter offer and say, we accept all the terms and conditions of your offer other than the fact that you have to be aware that the chandelier and the ceiling fans don't convey. So you'd have to do that with a, a counter offer or an addendum after the fact. But I don't think it's ever a good idea to do after the fact because what if the buyer falls in love with the property and they make an offer, their offer is accepted, and they really fell in love with it because they love that chandelier in the entryway. And then they find out that it's not going to convey. You might, yeah, you might. So I always think it's a good idea. Any fixtures that the sellers are going to take with them, take them before they list it. And if they're going to replace it with something, replace it. If they're not, then, ju then just leave it the way it is. If there's any damage, repair the damage. Or if you're not going to do it, just leave it the way that it is. It's kind of like with the, with the flat screen TVs. Now, most flat screen TVs are, are, are so cheap that it's probably cheaper to go out and buy a new one than having somebody come out and take that old one down and have to repair the damage that is caused from the bracket that's on there. Or some people just remove the TV from the bracket or from the bracket, leave the bracket up on the wall. Now, how does that look when they're showing their house and you look up, you walk into a nice great room and you see just a bracket up on the wall versus a TV it's kind of it's kind of an eyesore so I'm a big believer in educate your the sellers and any fixtures that they're going to take with them I, I would always recommend take them down take them down or remove them before you list it 
<coughs> the legal test of a fixture. So how do we determine whether or not something is real or personal property? Number one, the method of attachment. So a dishwasher versus a refrigerator because typically most refrigerators are on wheels and you just slide them into a cutout, don't you? And then plug them into the wall. Or if they have a water dispenser or an ice maker, you hook up the, uh, the water supply line to the little valve behind the refrigerator. So those are typically considered personal property, okay? Now a dishwasher, is a dishwasher attached? A dishwasher is attached. You have a plumbing line that goes to it. You have a supply line. You have a drain line that goes to it. It's typically attached to the cabinets that it's sitting inside of. So that would be an example of a difference between two appliances. One's real property and another is personal property. Now, have you ever seen a refrigerator that's built in? Like a sub-zero refrigerator or some of the more, the fancier refrigerators that are actually built into the cabinets? Those would be real property because they are attached. How about like a washer and dryer? What would those be? Real or personal property? Personal property. How about a microwave? Depends. What if it's attached to the cabinets? It's real property. What if it's just sitting on the counter? <coughs> Personal property. Yeah. What, would, what are some other examples you think of a, of a fixture? Okay. And when you buy that faucet and it's in the box, it's what? Personal property, but once you install it, it becomes real property. Okay. Uh, adaptability. If an item is manufactured to fit in a regular sized space, so, for example, you guys, if you had a, uh, a, uh, a home and you had a space in your home that was a really odd or irregular sized space and there really wasn't much that you could do with it, so you had something built, something built custom that fit right in that space, okay? When we talk about adaptability, chances are you couldn't take that irregularly, irregular sized item that you had built to fit in that space and take it and put it somewhere else because of the odd shape. So when you look at adaptability, you have to look at something. If there's something that's built, like let's say you had a bookshelf built for that irregular sized space, even if that bookshelf wasn't attached to the wall, then chances are it would still be considered real property because of the adaptability, because it's in a very odd sized space. How about things like window coverings? So do you think wood shutters, would those be real or personal property? Real property. How about curtains? Well, what are those curtains attached to? They're attached to a rod, and that rod is attached to the wall. Those would be considered real property. So, and one thing, if you were walking through a listing, and you noticed that the curtains match the bedspread or the couch, you probably, there's a good indicator that, the, that the seller is probably planning on taking those curtains with. And could they take curtains with unless they disclosed it to a buyer? No, because those would be a fixture, an improvement, and that would have to stay with the real property. That's why it's always a good idea to give your sellers a little education on what's real property and what's personal property. The what? Well, it depends. Is the plant in the ground or is it in a pot? If it's in the ground, what would it be? Real property. If it's in a pot, it would be personal property. Was there a hand back there that I saw? Solar panels would be, typically those are attached to a roof. So those would be real property. The relationship of the parties. So a tenant installing a ceiling fan versus a landlord. So if a landlord installs a ceiling fan, would that be real or personal property once it's attached? Real. It's real property. What if a tenant is leasing a house and they call up the landlord and they say, hey, can I install a ceiling fan in the master bedroom? And the landlord says, sure, you could install it. Once they install it, who does that ceiling fan belong to? It belongs to the tenant. And does the tenant have the right to remove that before they, their, te their lease expires? Yeah, they do. Now, if there's any damage that they cause, they would be responsible for that. But when do you think that that ceiling fan that the tenant installed, when would that become real property? Once, once their lease expires, they move out, 
landlord regains possession, now it's a fixture, now it's real property and it belongs to the landlord. So if a, if a tenant decides to install fixtures, should they remove those before the lease expires? Yes. The intention of the annexor, this is the most important test of a fixture. So what is the intention of the person that is attaching that item? Kind of like the TV. So when you take that flat screen TV and you mount it to a bracket and you put that bracket up on the wall, are you intending for that TV to be attached and to be real property? Are you intending for that to be personal property? Now our new version of our contract specifically states that the, t the TV itself is personal property, but the bracket would be real property. I don't agree with that, personally. I think that if you're mounting a TV to a bracket and putting that bracket on the wall, that bracket and that TV is, is one, one piece, and that would be a fixture. But they, well, so would a water softener. A water softener and the pipes in the house would be sold separately. The microwave that you installed would be sold separately. The ceiling fan would be sold separately. But once you attach those, then they become real property. I, I don't agree with that part of the contract. And I always ask sellers when I take a listing, if they have TVs up on the wall, well, what are you planning on doing with those TVs? Are you going to leave those here along with the bracket? Or are you going to take those with you? And if you're going to take them with you, are you going to take the bracket with it? Or are you going to leave it? And if you're, going to, if you're going to take the bracket with it, are you going to repair the drywall or are you just going to leave it with a, a big hole in the wall? That's a good question right there, Stephen. So could the buyer look at that and say, you know what, I don't want that TV hanging on the wall. I'm going to ask in my, in my offer, I'm going to ask the seller to remove that. Because what if the seller put in the listing all flat screen TVs to convey? Which means that they're not planning on taking them with them. They're planning on leaving those there. And if you were the buyer and you said, well, I don't want those TVs hanging on the wall. I don't, I don't want that. Can you ask in the offer for the seller to remove those? Yeah, you absolutely could. That could be, that's, a, that's a negotiable uh, item. And they could say no. That's right, and then you have the option to say, well, okay, then I don't want to buy your house. The what? It, it all depends on what you negotiate, maybe. I mean, these days, flat screen TVs aren't that expensive compared to, you know, 10 plus years ago when you might spend 10 or 15,000 bucks for a flat screen TV. I mean, now you could go and get a 60-inch a, a TV for probably for 500 bucks. So, yeah, if it was, if, if, the, if, the, if the buyer walked in and that fixture was there, and then they, their, their agent said, oh, by the way, that, that real nice chandelier in the entryway, that's not going to convey. So the buyer could look at that and say, well, okay, then I'm not, I'm not going to pay them what they're asking for the house. I'm going to make them a discounted offer. So. That's up to the buyer to do, and it would be up to the seller to decide, is that something that they want to accept, reject, or make a counteroffer? Well, typically staged items are, pers are personal property. You have furniture, you have pictures that might hang on the wall. I mean, if you have a picture that was hanging on a nail, that's personal property. But if you had any item that was permanently attached, then you would want to make sure that either those are going to stay or that you notify the buyer that those do not convey. The agreement of the parties. So to avoid disputes, it's always wise to specify in the contract any item that could be considered either real or personal property. And I think flat screen TVs are a good example of that. So if at, if the seller does it, is, isn't planning on uh, leaving the TVs and they're mounted to a bracket, even though our new contract is, is going to specify that the bracket is real property but the TV is not, I would still notify the buyer that, hey, the flat screen TV is not going to convey. 
Severance, that's changing real property back to personal property. So once something is attached and made part of the real property, can you sever it from its method of attachment and it now become personal property again? Yeah, absolutely. So could you take that ceiling fan down? And once you take it down, now it's personal property again. What about if you take the chandelier down? Or the flat screen TV? Those are Once they're severed from their method of attachment, they would become personal property. So we could, we could turn real pro or personal property into real property by attaching it, and then we could turn that real property back into personal property by severing it from its method of attachment. Is that like cable boxes or something that are mounted within a utility? Um, boxes inside like a laundry room or something like that? Does, if like the tenant moves out and that stays there, does that now belong to the owner? Or how would that come? Well, it depends. A lot of times they, the tenant doesn't own that cable box. It's owned by the cable company. So that would be something, no, that would have to be something that would have to go back to the cable company. Or if something, uh, uh, a piece of personal property is leased and, it, and it, it's on the property, then at some point they'd have to work out that leased equipment's going to have to go back. Okay. And, and that was an item years ago as well. A satellite dish is attached, isn't it? But what about the receiver that operates the dish? It's not. But what good is that satellite dish without the receiver? It's no good. So that's something that's in our, the, the, the current version of our contract is satellite dishes and all receivers have to convey because is that receiver part of the real property or part of the dish that's attached? Yeah. Kind of like if you have a swimming pool, okay, a swimming pool is an improvement. It's real property. But how about if you go and buy one of those little vacuums that you plug in that, that swims along the bottom of your pool and cleans it? Is that real property or personal property? It's personal property. Now, can you t should you take that with you? Because it's part of what? It's part of the pool, which is real property. And that's another item that was in our last revision of our contract is any pool equipment has to convey. So if you have a pool and you have one of those vacuums on the bottom, that has to convey because even though it's personal property, it's part of that pool, which is the real property. No, that would not. Above ground spas, it's movable, and that would be personal property. Unless it's built in, right? Unless it's built in. If it's built, or if you built like a, a, a deck around it, not a gazebo, no. Not if there's a gazebo around it. If you built a deck around that and you couldn't easily move that spa, you'd have to take the deck down to remove it, that's different. But if you just have that under a gazebo and you could still move it, that would be personal property. Tangible versus uh, intangible assets. Tangible is corporal, which means something that's visible or something that you could physically touch. And then intangible is incorporeal. Those are assets that are not visible. So what do you think would be an example, you guys, of a tangible or corporate asset? Would land be tangible? Can you see or touch land? How about any improvement that you put on that land? Would that be corporal? How about that, how about that reservation that grows across the back of your property? Well, what if there's no fence? What if it just is indicated in the deed that the back 20 feet of that property is reserved for the, for the previous owner to use. That would be intangible, or same thing like an easement or a right-of-way. So we have both tangible and intangible assets. Trade fixtures, those are items of personal property that are used in a trade or business. Now, a few minutes ago, we said that a fixture is what? Real property or personal property? Real property. Now, a trade fixture, on the other hand, a trade fixture is any item of personal property that's used in a business, okay? Regardless if it's attached or not, it still is personal property and it belongs to the tenant. So let's say that you, as a tenant, you leased a space and you were going to open up a pizza shop, okay? And in that pizza shop, you had counters that were attached to the ground and you had menus that were attached to the wall 
and you had an oven that was built into the wall, okay? Even though those items are attached, they're still personal property and they belong to the tenant. So the, does the tenant have the right to remove all those trade fixtures before their lease expires? Yes, they do. And like we said with the ceiling fan, when would those trade fixtures, when is the only time that those trade fixtures would become real property? After the lease expires, if those are remaining on the property after the lease expires, landlord regains possession. If those trade fixtures are there, now those are now those belong to the to the unit owner and they would be real property. Oh sure. Yeah, no, I am using that that lease because because you're just a tenant. If you're leasing a space for commercial use, whatever items that you use in there, whether they're attached or not, they're called trade fixtures. And those trade fixtures are always personal property, regardless if they're attached or not. And they could always be removed prior to the expiration of the lease agreement because they're personal property. But the only time they become real property is if they're left on the property after the lease expires. Emblements. Those are growing marketable annual crops. And the first type of implement that we're going to talk about are called uh, fructus industrials. And those are crops that include such things as wheat, corn, cotton, oats, and they are considered personal property. So if you had land If you had a piece of land, and let's say on that land, let's say this was 100 acres. And on that 100 acres, you grew corn and wheat and oats. Okay. Now, when you plant those, you're planting those and you're harvesting those. That It might be annually. It might be two times a year. It might be three times a year. So are you planting those with the intention of them being permanent? No, because you're going to harvest those and you're also using those for commercial purposes. So implements would be considered personal property and they would belong to the seller. And the big point about implements that you that you want to remember, you guys, is down in letter C under number four. If your contract is silent, which means that the the implements are not mentioned in the contract, the crops are considered personal property and they belong to the seller. So let's say that the farmer here decides that, let's say that Farmer Joe here is going to, wants to sell his property to farmer, to farmer John, okay? So, you know, Farmer John and Farmer Joe have known each other for years and they get together and they work out an agreement to sell Farmer Joe's land, and they didn't use any real estate professionals. They didn't use an attorney. They just got together, drew up a contract. What if they didn't mention in the contract after they after they after ownership uh, trades hands? What if they didn't mention who those implements belong to after the deed is delivered and accepted and ownership transfers? Who would own those implements? So. If Farmer Joe sells his property to Farmer John, Farmer John takes ownership, Farmer Joe delivers a deed, the deed's accepted, so uh, ownership exchanges hands. Who now owns those implements if it's not mentioned in the contract? They still belong to Farmer Joe. They're personal property and they belong to Farmer Joe. So does Farmer Joe have the right to come back and, and remove those at some point? Yes, they do. Now they can't go back and replant them and come back and do it again, but do they but do they have the right to go back and take those crops if it wasn't mentioned in the contract? Yeah, because it's personal property and it belongs to the seller. Now there's something that's called a UCC1 that you'd that you'd want to file for that personal property. So if you were a farmer, you'd want to uh, record something that's called a UCC1 and that governs personal property so that you would know that, hey, if I ever sell this, if, that, if those implements are not mentioned in the contract, which if they were using any kind of a real estate professional or, or an attorney, 
they would mention in that contract who's going to get those emblems once that property closes escrow. But if they don't, then they would still be personal property and they'd belong to the seller. Within the term of the zone, does the plant on the zone until they're all Not until those were removed. Well, not over those. They could plant in another area, but they couldn't plant over those. Uh, B, naturals. Those are crops grown on perennial roots such as trees, bushes, and vines. And those are considered real property. So like, uh, like you had mentioned, if you have bushes that are planted in the ground in your backyard, would those be real or personal property? Real property. If you had orange trees and lemon trees in your backyard, would those be real or personal property? Real property. Strawberries. If they were planted, if they were in the ground, they would be what? Real property. What if those strawberries were in pots? Then they'd be personal property. What if you had rose bushes in 20 pots in your backyard? Would those be real or personal property? Personal property. But if they were in the ground, then they'd be real property. Okay, see the marketable characteristics of land. The market of characteristics, the marketable characteristics of land, you guys, we always abbreviate with the acronym DUST. And that acronym DUST stands for demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. Okay. Now demand is a need or desire. Utility is the ability to satisfy that need or desire. So let's say that you had a hundred buyers, a hundred buyers out looking for homes in a particular area. What has to be available to satisfy their demand? There has to be homes available. So that's what utility is. The ability to satisfy that need or desire. Okay. Scarcity is when you have a lack of supply in a given area. So if there was 100 buyers, but there was only 10 homes for sale, okay, that's what we call scarcity. So if you have 100 buyers out there, but only 10 homes available for sale, what are those 100 buyers going to do to make their offer more attractive than the next guy? They're going to increase it. So this is in economics when we talk about supply and demand. This is going to be a scenario when demand is greater than supply, okay? So when demand is greater than supply, what typically happens to prices? Prices will rise, okay? Now, when you have the opposite that occurs, if you have 100 buyers out there and you have 300 homes available for sale, now, the supply is going to be greater than demand. And typically in that economic scenario, when supply is greater than demand, what happens to prices? Prices are going to decrease. Okay, And then transferability, that's the ability to transfer ownership. And we always say, what are the three most important things in real estate? That's right, location, location, location. But in order for that location, location, location to have value, it must have demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. And we said transferability is the ability to transfer ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what kind of demand is there for that particular property that they are that they are looking for? Could be. And if that's the if you're the seller, you're going to be that's that's a good position to be in if you're the seller. Now transferability, we said the ability to transfer ownership. So 
if you had a property that was located in the best part of town, so we, it has the best location imaginable, but let's say that you have a clouded or defective title, which is preventing you from transferring ownership, is that, is that property going to have much value, even though it's located in the, it's, it has the best location in town? No. So we always say, the three most important things in real estate are location, location, location. But in order for that location, location, location to have value, it has to have demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. Now, when we say a, a defective or clouded title, does anybody know what that is? Or could be if a, if a property was tied up in probate or any kind of an encumbrance on the property, you guys, that's going to prevent the owner from transferring ownership. So like Stephen brought up, if a property was tied up in probate, you're not going to be able to transfer ownership until it clears probate. That's a really good example right there. Um, no, because you still, have to, you still have time to sell it. You still have time before that trustee sale to sell that. Now, once it goes to that foreclosure sale, no, then at that point, you're out of luck. Um, yeah, but, it, but a lot of liens can be satisfied. when you, you, just, you pay them off and those liens are satisfied. But if you have some sort of a cloud or a defect on that title, like you mentioned about probate, or let's say that the property was sold, and there's an example that I always use because there was a lady in, in one of my classes years and years ago, and when we were talking about this, she raised her hand and she goes, John, I used to, I used to be an escrow officer in Florida, and I was involved with a transaction where the sellers were a husband and wife, and the husband and wife were not divorced, but they were separated. Husband lived in the house, wife moved to another state. They weren't divorced, they were separated. So the husband thought it'd be a good idea to sell the house without the wife's permission. He sold the house, had somebody forge the wife's name, signature on the deed, had somebody notarize the deed, it was recorded and ownership transferred to the buyer. Now the wife came back into town two years later, found out that the husband sold the house, claimed an ownership interest. That's going to put a cloud on title. And if you didn't have title insurance, you would have a huge mess on your hands. But luckily, the buyer had title insurance. The title insurance company got involved. They paid the claim to the wife, and then they went after the husband as the responsible party for forging that deed. But we always say that in order for property to have value, it has to have demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. The physical characteristics of land, uniqueness. Remember we said no two parcels are alike. And why are no two parcels ever alike? Because they all, they all have their separate APN or identification numbers. Durability or indestructibility, land can't be destroyed because of, that, because of the legal description. Immobility, land it can't be moved because of its fixed location. So if you have a piece of land that's located in a part of town that's not really desirable, can you pick it up and move it somewhere else? No, but can you, how about any improvements? Can you move any improvements on that land? Yeah, you might be able to move improvements on there, but you can't move the land itself, so it's a fixed location. Well, the land itself, you could destroy the value, yes, but you can't destroy the land itself because even if you put something that's radioactive on there, you still have a legal description for it. So that legal description isn't going away. Nobody probably is going to want to buy that. So are you going to have demand for that property? No, you're taking demand out of there. So if there's no demand, you're basically going to destroy the value. But you can't destroy the land itself. You could destroy the value, but not the land itself. The what? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Or somebody that likes to wear a hazmat suit. <laughs> the economic characteristics of land, improvements, whether they're man-made or natural, fixed investments, things like utilities installed to your property. Because remember we said, you don't own all the utility lines that run to your property, you guys, but do you benefit from those utilities running to your property? Yeah, you do, because those add value. And we said, do the utility companies install those with the intention of removing those? No, they install those with the intention of those being permanent. 
scarcity, the lack of land that's suitable for development in an area. And like we said, when you have a scenario where supply is going to be less than demand, what's going to happen to prices? They're going to increase. Situs, which is area preference or what we refer to as location, location, location. So we said location, location, location is the most important economic characteristic of land. But what does that location, location, location have to have in order to have value? Demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. Fixtures and personal property problems. The contract wording dictates the actions of the parties. So like we said, you guys, if a seller decides not to remove a fixture before they sell their property, is that something that they have to disclose to a buyer once a buyer makes an offer? That that fixture is not going to convey? Because if they don't disclose it, would it have to stay? Yeah, and how come? Because it's part of the real property. Because real property consists of land plus the improvements. And would a fixture be an improvement? Yes, it would. So any time that you have any sort of fixture that's not going to convey, you don't want to just put it in the listing. You want to make sure that it is in the purchase contract between the buyer and the seller. And that the buyer, that it's properly disclosed to them that that fixture is not going to convey. Oral or verbal statements are not enforceable. So you never want to have any sort of a verbal agreement, you guys, between the buyer and the seller regarding fixtures or personal property. Like there was one time I had a, a buyer that was, went by the property that they made an offer on and the seller happened to be outside. So they started talking and they worked out a verbal agreement to where the seller was going to leave the washer and the dryer. Buyer never told me about it. So we did their walkthrough. After they did their walkthrough, they closed escrow. When they went to go move in, guess what was gone? The washer and dryer. And they call me up, John, the washer and dryer is missing. And I'm like, well, we didn't ask him for the washer and dryer. Well, when I was by there a couple of weeks ago, I talked to the seller, and the seller said that they were going to keep it. And I said, well, that was the first mistake, is that we don't want, we can't have any verbal agreements between you and the seller. If that was something that you wanted, we should have asked the seller for those items of personal property, and we should have put it in writing and either put it in the contract or made it an amendment or an addendum to that contract because verbal agreements like that are not enforceable. All listing information needs to be verified by the buyer and included in the contract. And there's a section in our contract, you guys, that specifies personal property. Now, we have three boxes in our contract, which what do you think are the three most common personal property items that a buyer asks the seller to leave? We just mentioned two of them. Washer, dryer, and refrigerator. Okay, those are the three most common. So in our contract, we have under the items of personal property, we have washer, dryer, and refrigerator, and you could just check those boxes. So if the buyer wants to ask the seller for those, you just check those three boxes. Now, you always want to describe the items of personal property because if you just put washer, dryer, refrigerator, are you necessarily, you, I mean, you know what the buyer is asking for. The buyer is asking for the ones that are on the property, but what if what is left is something that is different? And that happened to me once. Before the, that section was in our contract, we asked the seller, for the refrigerator. Now the refrigerator that was in the kitchen was a nice white Maytag side by side with a water and ice dispenser. And then out on the patio was an old mustard yellow colored refrigerator <laughs> that they kept all their beer in. And guess which one was in the kitchen when the buyer moved in? Not the one that they asked for. Now, yeah, what, surprise, surprise, huh? Now the buyer was all ticked off and they called me and said, John, the mustard yellow colored refrigerator was the one in the kitchen and I called up the the listing agent and that was that was my fault. I mean, we 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 know what we were asking for, but should I have described that? Yes, I should have. And that was one of the reasons why now in our contract we have those boxes that you could check. But could I have described that where it said 
white Maytag side-by-side -side refrigerator and maybe put a model number or a serial number if we knew that? Yeah, we sh I should have, and that cost me about 1100 bucks for that mistake, and I never made that mistake again afterwards because I bought the buyer a new refrigerator. I didn't have to, but like I said, it's, it was easier for me to do that than if they decided to sue somebody for it and I had to use my E&O insurance to, uh, to, rep to, have us, to have me represented. So it was much easier to buy something than the alternative. So any, and, and what, I see, what you're even seeing today, you guys, is agents that will either take pictures or videos of personal property items and making those uh, part of the contract so that there's no discrepancy afterwards what items of personal property you are asking for. Ownership of real property could either be through what's known as a feudal or a lodial system. Now, a feudal system, you guys, that's when a head of state owns all the land and they give individuals the right to use the land. So is that what type of ownership system we have in our country where you have one person or the government that owns all the land and they give the people the right to use it? No, we have an allodial system, which is individual ownership rights. Now, could you think of a, a, a scenario here in Arizona where it would be a, a feudal type system? Yeah, the reservations. That's right, because the reservations own all the land, and they typically give the members the right to use that land. Now, I know in some situations, you as a tribal member could buy that land, but a lot of them, they own the land, the tribe does, and they give the individuals the right to use that land. That's government owned and they don't, they, they don't give, well, they might give individuals the right to use it. Let's, let's say if, they were, if you were going to set up a business uh, in, in a national park. You wouldn't own the land, you just have the right to use it. Possibly. The owner's bundle of rights. These are intangible rights, you guys, that also convey with real property. Because remember earlier we said, what are those rights that you get when you buy a piece of real property? You get the land, you get the surf, you get the you get the land, the improvements, the appurtenances, you get the surface, the subsurface, the air rights, but you're also going to get these fa these six what we call bundle of rights, okay? Now these are intangible rights or rights that you can't see that go along with that real property. And the first one is the right of possession. So when you buy a piece of real property, do you have the right to possess and occupy that real property? Yep, you do. Enjoyment, you have the right to use the property and nobody's gonna have any sort of superior rights. Control, you have the right to control the property within the framework of the law. So if that's a residential property, can you use it for residential purposes? Yes, if it's a residential property, can you use it for commercial purposes? No. So you have to use it within the framework of the law, and that includes zoning. Exclusion, you have the right to exclude others from your property. So do you have the right to put a no trespassing <laughs> sign on your property? Sure. Encumber, you have the right to encumber your property, which means you have the right to place a lien on your property. You could grant an easement. You could cloud the title. Now. When we're talking about encumbrances, you guys, an encumbrance is going to be a lien, claim, charge, or limitation on use. So an encumbrance, an encumbrance is going to be a lien, a claim, a charge. or a limitation on use. Now there's a general rule of thumb when it comes to encumbrances and that is that a lien is always an encumbrance but an encumbrance is not always a lien. And the reason that we say that is because a lien is always something that is related to money. And what do you think is the most common lien that you'll find on real property? A mortgage, that's probably the most common. What else? Mechanics lien, anything else you could think of? 
property taxes, maybe an HOA lien, okay? Yeah, if you had an IRS, if there was a, an IRS lien that they put on, that's a general lien that would affect all property that you own. So those are going to be liens. They're dealing with money or something that you put up that you put that property up as collateral for something like a bail bond, okay? When you go out and get a bail bond, if you put your property up as collateral for that bond, you're allowing that bondsman to put a lien on that property as collateral, okay? And in the event that that bond is not returned, they have a lien and they might be able to foreclose on that lien depending on what that lien position is. So we always say that a lien is always an encumbrance, but these are going to be examples of encumbrances that are not liens because they're not financial or they're not dealing with anything that you put that property up as collateral for. So a claim would be maybe a, a mining or a mineral claim, uh, adverse possession, which we'll talk about in another lesson. Those would be examples of claims. A, a charge, an example of a charge would be a lease agreement that you have on a property. Limitations on use would be things like an easement, a right of way, a, yeah, a reservation. CC&Rs, okay? So limitations on use, you guys, are going to be things that is going, it's going to prohibit the landowner from using that property for a particular use. So again, if we have our lot here, if you had a 20-foot a utility easement that went across the back of your property right there, is that going to be a limitation on use? Yeah, because is, it, is the landowner restricted on what they could do on that back 20 feet of their property? They can't improve it because you can't restrict access for SRP who owns that easement. Now, remember we said, does SRP own that back 20 feet of your property? No, they just have the right to use that. Same thing with a reservation or a right-of-way, okay? So it's going to be a limitation on use because it's going to limit what the landowner could do on that back 20 feet of their property. Same thing with CC&Rs, because remember, CC&Rs are rules that are in place that tell the landowner what they can and cannot do, okay? Now, with CC&Rs, who creates those? They could be created by a city, a county, a developer, uh, the landowner, okay? So once those restrictions are in place, is that going to be a restriction on what that landowner can and cannot do? Yeah. So if there's, if the city, like let's say that the city had CC&Rs on your, uh, that were recorded against a property that said that, that you could not park, you have to park your car on your driveway at night, you can't park on the street, would that be a restriction? That would be a limitation on you. So that means that you couldn't park your car off of your property, you'd have to park it in your driveway or in your garage at night if that was a restriction. So it wasn't an easement or a right-of-way because he owned the land. Okay. I don't know. I mean, that, I don't know, really know the answer to that because I, I don't know the real situation with both of those. Because are they separate parcels? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to see that, look at the parcels and look at the zoning and the uses to kind of come up with an answer for that. So that, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay.
didn't pain from you? Like just out of the blue? Or let's say a pipe broke on main line and out on the street. Why am now liable? So I thought if he just was on my property, up typically, the typically, property. typically that's 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 no, that's that's typical. Where you would, as the landowner, you would be responsible for everything on your property. Everything off of the property would belong to whoever installed those utility lines. So if it was the city of Mesa, then it would be the city of Mesa's responsibility to maintain those. Really? Yeah. I've, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. I am over a developer. I own it by Kingman and Discovery. Okay. okay. Wow. So did they did they turn ownership of that over to your HOA? Do you live in an area that's governed by an HOA? Did they turn ownership of that over to the HOA and say, we're no longer going to maintain this sewer line, so if anything breaks, it's now your responsibility? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Okay. But it's still it's still it's still something that if the city put those in and you're paying your utility bills, that's their responsibility to maintain. So I, I I'm not sure. I've never heard of never I've never sold a property where that was the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. But all around the people that are not part of the HOA have money in the street. Not just slurry, but some have actually asphalt that all around them. Um, I just find that kind of odd that, you know, they just put that side to this and that, but not when it comes to, like, the sewer thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that one. Patrick? It, that's why I said was ownership turned over to... But even that, I've I've lived in I've li I live in a gated community now, and I did before I live I lived in my previous home or my current home, and even though inside that gated community the streets are private, the utilities are still owned by the town of Gilbert. So, if there was a break in the sewer line, then it would be the town of Gilbert that would be responsible for that, and not the homeowner, unless it was on my on your property. So I'm not sure about that one. And then finally, disposition, and that's the right to sell, gift, lease, barter, or exchange your property. So again, you guys, when you buy a piece of real property, you get the land, the improvements, the appurtenances, the surface, subsurface, air rights, plus all these bundle of rights that go with it, but they're all going to be subject to the four rights of the government, or what we call the four government powers. And the first one is police power. And that first part of police power, protect the general health, safety, and welfare of society. Okay, And that also includes things like zoning, planning, building codes, deed restriction, licensing, rent control, environmental issues. So it's not just, you guys, it's not just the black and white squad car driving around making sure that we're behaving ourselves. It's also going to include things like zoning, building codes, deed restrictions, so an example of zoning would be if you owned a parcel, if that parcel was zoned residential, could you use it for commercial purposes? No. Or if it was zoned commercial, could you use it for residential purposes? No. So if you submitted a set of plans on a residential parcel to build a commercial building, is that municipality or county going to issue you a building permit and approve your plans? Probably not because they'll say, your lot is non-conforming to your, your intended use. So that's a form of police power. So can that city or county tell you what you can and cannot build on that, land, on that lot? Yeah, and that's a form of police power. Taxation. So when you buy a piece of real property, you guys, do you have the choice
Do you have the choice when you buy a piece of real property, when you're signing your closing documents before you leave the title company, does the escrow officer say, oh, by the way, before you leave, make sure you check the box either yes or no as to whether or not you want the government to levy taxes on your land. How many of you guys got the option to do that? Normally somebody usually raises their hand, but do you have the choice as to whether or not the government's going to levy taxes? No, because that's one of the rights of the government. Now you have the choice as to whether or not you're going to pay those property taxes, and we'll talk about that in another lesson, and talk about if you don't pay them, what will happen. But you don't have a choice as to whether or not the government's going to levy taxes on that land, because that's going to be th their right. Uh, three, eminent domain, which is the government's right to take private property for public good. Now, condemnation, you guys, that's the government's right to take private property for public good, but can they just take it without compensating the landowner for it? No, they can't. And when they actually give fair market value and then take the land, that's called condemnation. So the process or the power that the government has to take private property for public good, that's called eminent domain. But once they give fair market value and take the property, that's called condemnation. Now, how do they determine that fair market value? Well, you, so you might think so, but that has to, it has to be, you normally are going to have anywhere between three, one and three appraisals done on the property by an unbiased appraiser to determine market value. Now again, you as the landowner might think that, that that market value is great, or you might not agree with that market value. And if you don't, then it's going to be at your expense to fight that. Most people don't have, the sad reality is that most people don't have the money to fight the government. Now, in some cases where you do fight the government, sometimes you might win because you might be able to prove that that valuation is wrong or that the they're not taking that property for public good. It might be for private good. Uh, severance damages, those may be paid if the landowner has part of the land condemned, causing harm to the remaining parcel. So if you have a piece of property, you guys, and it's going to, it was going to be condemned through eminent domain. Let's say this is your parcel here. Okay. Let's say that's a 10 acre parcel and the city's going to come through and they want to condemn half of your property because they need to put in a new freeway. Okay. So if they condemn half of your land but they leave you with five remaining acres, you might be eligible for severance damages because could the value of that remaining five acres be affected because of what they put in there? Yeah, possibly. And if so, then you might be eligible for what's known as severance damages. A, a sinkhole where? Because, and it's not safe? That could, they, they, that could, that could, that could be possible. Uh, inverse condemnation, that's if you request to have your property condemned. So let's say your neighbor over here, who also has five acres, says, well, hey, I don't want a freeway running through the front of my yard, so I want, I want the city to condemn my property, too. The city might say, well, you know what? We don't need to condemn your property because we already own the right-of-way out in front, which allows us to put that freeway in, but we don't need to condemn your land. So you could request to have your property condemned, but if the, if the city in this example doesn't need your land, they're not going to condemn it. But what you might be eligible for is the consequential damages, which is activity elsewhere that harms value. So if you requested to have your property condemned, but the city didn't condemn it because they don't need it, could you be eligible for damages that could affect your property's value? Yeah, and do you think that might be going on out in Ahwatukee in the near future? Because what are they doing out there? Yeah, they're putting, in, they're putting a freeway in, and that freeway, a lot of those houses that back to Pecos, those properties are now going to back to a new freeway. Eventually they will. Yeah? If it's needed for a road, it, it, it could be condemned. Now, I, I, would, I would say that the majority of people that I've ever met that had their property condemned from the government, 
we're very happy with the value that, was, that, were, that they were given. But if you're not and you disagree with that value, then it would be at your expense to fight it. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, Quasi-public organizations, so utilities and railroads, they also have the power of eminent domain. So if SRP needed to condemn privately owned land to build a new substation to, for public good, do they have that power to do it? Yeah, but again, it has to be, they have to condemn that private property for public good. So they have to be able to show that the reason for them condemning that property is in the best interest of the public. And then the last right of the government or government power is S cheat. And that's when real property reverts to the state if you die with no will and no heirs. So if John Doe here dies, okay, John Doe dies, John Doe's either going to die with a will or without a will, okay? Now if John Doe dies with a will, we call that dying testate. So John Doe has a will. Now, just because John Doe has a will, that doesn't mean that as soon as he dies, all the assets that are in his estate are going to go to who he wants them to in his will, because that will has to go somewhere first before the assets are going to be distributed to the heirs. And that's called probate. Okay? And probate is a court that will determine if that will is valid, and then probate's also going to pay any debts of that estate. Okay, So if there was a debt that was owed by John Doe when he dies, is John Doe just exonerated from that responsibility of paying that debt? No. If he dies with a will, and that goes to probate, that's part of the functions of probate is to pay any debts of that estate. Now if John Doe dies and he doesn't have a will, we call that dying intestate. Okay. And then again, what's going to happen to his estate? What's well, going to go to probate? And then probate's going to determine, does John Doe have any heirs? Okay. So, and there's a pecking order, and we'll go over that in another uh, lesson. It's called Arizona's Intestate to Succession. So basically, there's going to be a pecking order as far as if, if, the, if probate finds that John Doe has heirs, how do they determine who's going to inherit what? It's based on how those heirs are related to the deceased. So who do you think has first, who's going to be on the top of that list? A spouse, that's right. And then it goes down the intestate line to succession. I'm not exactly sure what they are. I'd have to look it up in the book. But there is a, a, a pecking order. Oh, but not as far as property rights. Yeah, it's called Arizona's Intestate to Succession, and it's in lesson, I think it's in lesson 11 when we, when, we, when we go over that. Now, what if probate determines, after checking that line to succession, that John Doe doesn't have any heirs? Then what? Then who gets all of the stuff? Then it goes to the state through S. Cheat. Okay, so those are going to be the four rights of the government. So we say when you buy a piece of real property, you get... The land, the improvements, appurtenances, the surface, the subsurface, the air rights, the bundle of rights. But all those rights are going to be subject to the four rights of the government or the four government powers of police power, taxation, eminent domain, and a cheat. I'm not sure. Now, the mortgage company's not going to care because if they keep getting their payments, that's great. But it, I, I'm certainly not an estate planning attorney, and I don't, I, I, I don't claim to be one. So, in questions, because I get clients that get estate, uh, is, that have estate issues, and they'll call me and they ask, uh, they'll ask my advice on something. There might be something that I might know, but I will always recommend to them, call an attorney where you could get some a state planning uh, advice because you certainly don't want to try to take matters into your own hands. I'm 
I, I, again, something like that, Stephen, you'd probably want to talk to an estate planning attorney about. Yeah. Uh, other limitations on rights? We talked about easements. Now, remember we said, is an easement, does easement give ownership rights? No, it just gives you the right to use that land. So if you have your parcel here and you have a 20-foot utility easement that goes across the back of your property, does SRP own that land? No, no you, they just have the right to use that land. So an easement isn't going to allow for ownership rights. It's just going to allow for use only. Now, we'll go over next week different types of easements, whether it's an appurtenant easement, whether it's a gross easement, okay? An appurtenant easement is attached to the land. And remember we said, if something is appurtenant, if that land is sold, would that easement remain on the property or would it be terminated? It would remain because it's appurtenant, because it's attached to the land. So if this, if this utility easement was appurtenant, if this landowner sold the property, would the new buyer have to allow SRP to continue to use the back part of their land? Mm -hmm. Absolutely you do, yep, because you own it. They just, have, they just have the right to use it, that's it. They don't own it, they just have the right to use it. And then a license. A license is the right to use the land of another, you guys but it can be revoked at any time by the giver. Now, a utility easement like this, if it was a pertinent, it typically, uh, uh, an easement typically cannot be revoked. Now, a an easement can be terminated, and we'll talk more about that next week, but typically an easement could not be, or it could not be revoked, okay? But a license can. So here's an example. Let's say that you have a, let's say you have your land, and let's say that you gave your neighbor, your property owner A and your neighbor's property owner B. What if you have an area on the back part of your parcel that's shaded with trees and your neighbor said, hey, property owner A, how about if you give me the right to use that little back part of your property right there so I could park my new RV? And the, and the property owner said, a said, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the right to use that land. That would be what we call a license. It's not an easement, okay, but you're just giving somebody the right to use it. Now, really what's the big difference between a license and an easement is that a license can be terminated at any time. So could property owner A a week later wake up and say, you know what, I think I changed my mind. I don't think I want B to park their RV on the back part of my property. Can they revoke that right at any time? even if it's a written agreement that they recorded? Yeah, because it's not an easement. Now, if it was an easement, could property owner A wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to revoke that easement? No, typically not. And we'll talk about next week how an easement is terminated, but typically an easement can't be revoked, but a license can. So that's a difference. They're both the right to use the land of another. You don't own it. You just have the right to use it. Just one is revocable and the other one is not. And then restrictions, we talked about those already. So things like CC&Rs. Now remember we said, what are CC&Rs? Because that's an acronym. It stands for Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. So what are those? They're rules that are in place that tell the landowner what they can and cannot do, right? That's what a CC&R is. So remember we said, is a CC&R a limitation on use? Yeah, and that would be an encumbrance. So we say it's an encumbrance because if you're thinking about buying that pro this property and there's recorded CC&Rs, would you want to look at those? Because could it, that that's going to be an encumbrance on the property because it's going to be a limitation on use. There might be rules that tell you what you can and cannot do on that per on that particular land. And then bylaws. Those are created by an HOA because when an HOA is created, you guys, there has to be bylaws that are set up because an HOA is an entity that you create. And when you create an entity, there has to be bylaws. And those bylaws are going to be the rules of that entity. It's going to tell you what type of entity it is. Is it for-profit? Is it non-profit? Is there, is there um, 
Is there uh, a board of directors? And if there's a board of directors, who are those board of directors? So that's what the bylaws are going to be. And again, those, could, those are going to be a limitation on use. So how many of you guys live in an area where you have CC&Rs and you have an HOA that enforces those CC&Rs? Probably a lot of people. So not only do you have CC&Rs, but there's also bylaws, and those bylaws are the governing documents for the Homeowners Association. Okay, so any questions on anything that we went over tonight? I've, no, I've never seen one, Stephen, uh, in Maricopa County or Pinal County. I've, ne I've never seen it, uh, a Melarus tax. Oh, very common out there, but not here, no. What a, me what a Melarus, is there any properties out here that have a Melarus tax, which is basically an additional tax on land for things like schools or improvements? Yeah. They can be, yeah, they can be. Okay, let's do the practice problems really quick. Number one, broker sold a home at a commission rate of 7%. The gross commission was $4,500. What was the sale price? Don't leave yet, you guys, because I haven't taken roll yet. So do we have our components for our T here? Yes, we do. So what do we know? We, and what is that? That's the total commission, and we know the commission rate. So where does the total commission go? Goes up on top. And then the commission rate. So since we have one variable on the top and one on the bottom, we're going to divide those. So 4,500 divided by 7% would leave us a sales price of... 64,286. Two, what is the commission rate if a broker received a gross commission of $5,700 on a $95,000 sale? So do we have our components for our T here? Yeah, what do we know? We know the sale price and we know the total commission. So total commission on top, 5,700 divided by the sale price of 95,000, and that would leave us with a commission rate of 6%. What? No, that's what most people think, but there's no such thing as a set commission rate. It's always negotiable between the principal and the broker. And we'll talk about that in lesson four. Three, an owner lists property for sale with a broker at a price that will net them 110,000. After paying a 5% commission, what was the sale price? So do we have our T components here? Yeah, but this is going to be one of the net problems. So remember, what do we have to do to the commission since it's a seller net problem? 100 minus the commission rate. So our commission rate in this is 5%. So 100 minus 5% is 0.95. So we have our net of 110,000 divided by 95% would leave us a sale price of 115,790. Four, an investor sold his property for 185,000. This resulted in a 10% loss on his cost. What was the original cost? So to determine in these types of problems, you guys, the decimal that you're going to divide by, if it's a loss, then you'll divide by 100 minus the loss. And if it's a gain or a profit, then you'll divide by 100 plus the gain or the profit. So in this problem, is that 10%? Is that a loss or is that a gain? It's a loss. So the property originally sold for 185000 so 185,000, and divide that by 100 minus our loss. So 100 minus 10% is 0.90 or 90%. So then we could use our T here. We have um, 185,000 divided by 90%, and that would leave us with a sale price of 
555, okay? Now, what if we flip that around and this problem said, this resulted in a 10% profit or a 10% gain, then what would we divide by? 1.10 1, 1 or 110%. What if it said this resulted in a 25% profit or 25% gain, then what would we divide by? 125%. What if it was a 25% loss, what would we divide by? 0.75, okay? So just make a note of that, okay? Number five, a house sold for 325000 30% of the sale represented profit. What was the original cost? So if we have 325000 the house sold for 325000 So if 30% of that represented profit, 70% was cost. So 325 times 70% would be 227.5. Okay, any questions on anything, you guys, before I take roll?